Welcome to Second Take, the show that takes a look at the issues behind the news. The steel market has come into focus in recent months, with consumers complaining about ongoing protection in a context of supply backlogs and steep price increases. Terence Creamer joins me to discuss developments and the outlook. Hi Terence. Hi Chanel. What is the background to the current difficulties in the domestic steel market? Well, since before the lockdown, we've already saw that steel stocks were uh, being drawn down. And then with the lockdown, there's been major disruptions to production at ArcelorMittal South Africa, which is South Africa's only large primary steel producer left in the flat steel market. And that's caused major disruptions uh, to supply in South Africa. But also we've had an international market where there was supply chain disruptions and there's been a return to demand with steel featuring very much in the sort of uh, COVID recovery plans of many countries. So we've seen a, a rise in demand, difficulties in supplying that demand, and we've seen a surge in steel prices internationally. And domestically, this, there's a lot of unhappiness because not only were the, um, uh, was the steel in backlog and people couldn't get hold of the steel they needed, but th at the same time, the prices were rising quite steeply. So at the moment, around uh, hot rolled coils, around 19,000 rand a tonne, which is about double what it was before the lockdown. There is particular unhappiness about the ongoing implementation of safeguard duties. Yes, this goes back many years too, and uh, we had safeguards first introduced in 2017 at 12%, over and above the 10% base uh, protection that is applies to most uh, steel grades in South Africa. So that took it to 22% and there was unhappiness at that stage. That tapered uh, down to 10 and then 8% over the subsequent two years. Now that followed an ITAC investigation into whether there was dumping. They did find dumping from certain countries, which is unfair competition. But uh, you also have to prove that it's causing material uh, damage to your industry, which ArcelorMittal was able to show that it was causing. So that's why the, the safeguards were applied to try and um, even out or level the playing field between imports, which were at one stage really surging in South Africa and the domestic uh, production. So we had those safeguards introduced and it was a time-defined horizon from uh, 2017, meant to end just, uh, just before August um, 2020. But uh, ArcelorMittal South Africa applied and successfully uh, so for an extension of that safeguard. So the 8% uh, safeguard duty applies on hot rolled coil, which means effectively uh, uh, at the border, it's an 18% import duty. So you can imagine uh, in the context of backlogs, steel star, uh, s supply side disruptions, and uh, steep price rises, which are, are linked to international developments, this has caused a lot of unhappiness and there's a, there are a number of calls uh, for this safeguard to be eliminated immediately. And we even have a court case, Max Steel, South Africa's leading uh, steel merchant has taken this issue to the courts and there's going to be a, the matter's going to be heard on the 22nd of June uh, and is going to be defended by ArcelorMittal. Uh, and they're not only looking uh, to, to get that safeguard um, uh, eliminated, but they also want to be compensated for the duties they've paid to SARS since um, the, the extension, which was from about August 2020 until now and beyond. Uh, and they believe uh, they, they have a right to uh, call for that because they think the process that was followed by ITAC was unlawful. There's also ongoing discontent about the way AMSA prices its steel. Yes, this is a very historical issue that goes back decades too. And, uh, there was a so-called resolution between government and uh, ArcelorMittal going back a few years after we had competition tribunal investigations, after really much unhappiness about uh, import parity pricing methodology. Uh, they settled for flat steel, this doesn't apply to long steel, on a, um, a basket price. So they measure, uh, in that basket there are a number of countries, uh, they look at the, the domestic prices that are applying in those countries, they then adjust it for freight and for um, uh, exchange rate conditions and then we they set the domestic price so it's supposedly fair it's not a pure import parity price but uh, the issue is the, the nature or the makeup of that basket now a lot of the steel that we were getting uh, from these countries for instance where we were in our imports were surging from a country like china 
where the steel price is a lot more, uh, a lot cheaper or more competitive, uh, is not inside that basket. Whereas we've got countries that have got very high steel prices, such as Europe um, and the U.S., uh, where, where there's also in the U.S. massive protection. They've seen their steel prices almost triple. We've had ours double over the over the last year. Um, that's inside the basket. So there's a feeling that the basket is not fair and is continually, uh, continually leading to higher steel prices to downstream consumers than would be the case if another methodology was used. Or, and then on top of it, we've got the protection, which I think is uh, causing a lot of anxiety at the moment. Can the steel master plan process help to address some of these problems? Well, it's going to be interesting to see how that all unfolds. The, the feeling is there's quite a lot of animosity at the moment in the sector. Uh, people are po talking past each other. Uh, there's talk about there's uh, even discussion about whether we need a primary steel sector at all, whether we should just base our uh, manufacturing economy, our metals and engineering economy, purely on imports so that we can get um, the right quality, the right uh, grades of steel uh, at the prices that are the most competitive. There's a contestation around that because uh, you know if you don't have any primary steel producer and you're exposed to a a pandemic such as COVID, which disrupts supply chains, uh, I'm not too sure what the supply backlogs would have looked like if we had only been relying on imports. In fact, at the moment, if you place uh, orders for imported steel, it's a sort of a, a serious few months, four to up to eight months delay before you start getting delivery of that steel. So not having any primary production, I think, would be problematic for South Africa. But the anger has ridden, risen to that sort of level where what is the use of having a primary steel producer when you can't get your steel, you can't get your quality, and your price is higher than it would be if you were importing it. So, th so there is that, but there is a process underway to try and find each other through the steel master plan process. And I think a lot of the issues are going to be around the pricing framework, the protection framework. Is the protection framework really appropriate where you're protecting only the upstream sector where your downstream producers are facing serious competition uh, from imports of finished products and are really uh, one bad thing to get the steel to produce it, getting the steel more expensive even than what uh, some of the steel is landing um, uh, in South Africa in a finished way. So there's a, there is a lot of unhappiness. But ultimately, if the, f to succeed, the steel master plan has to find a way to increase the certainty of demand and have a demand uh, trajectory that continues to rise. You know, we've had this decimation of the steel market in South Africa. Um, we, we've seen, we see much lower off offtake levels. That makes it more difficult to be competitive for the primary producer because the volumes are lower and it's a, it's a real, it's, a, it's an economies of scale game. So there's a number of issues knocking around. So we need to find a way of raising demand and ultimately that comes down to economic growth which is a little bit outside of the steel master plan's uh, ambit. But if we can get the economy growing again, and then we have plans uh, within that, uh, we know we have the designation of steel, but a big opportunity, for instance, looks to be the, the, the renewable energy pro program, which looks like there's going to be security of demand for some years to come, because we're going to need to invest massively, both through utility scale type projects, wind and solar, the wind is particularly steel intensive, although there are concrete tower uh, alternatives that people are looking at. Um, but if we have that security of demand and we have a localization push around the renewable energy, I think that could create a new sort of anchor market for steel uh, that could see, uh, could help if other infrastructure sectors also start pumping. And once the infrastructure sectors start pumping and there's security of demand then, Hopefully the private sector investment will also start uh, flowing more aggressively. We should have seen much more investment, for instance, in the resources sector. Again, it looks like we're missing a super cycle uh, event through our lack of investment in infrastructure and, and, and mining projects. And, uh, you know, but ultimately we need uh, some sort of virtuous circle, starting with growth in a context where state-owned enterprises and uh, government doesn't have money that uh, those that infrastructure investment has to be uh, partially funded, it looks like, by the private sector. So the, the reforms that the president is talking about are crucial 
to get the, the, um, the framework in place for the private sector to start investing in, on, in these sort of what are traditionally public sector assets. It's not enough, but it can be an important start uh, to start getting the, um, the demand going again for key sectors such as steel. Thank you. That's the second tech show for this week. Thank you for watching and join us again next time for more news analysis. Also, don't forget to listen to the audio version of our Engineering News Daily Email Newsletter.